Hey everybody, welcome to my channel, Mark Ward on Words. I sort of call it, I don't know if I really have a name, it's just Mark Ward. Talk a lot about Bible translation. And I've recently been getting into talking a little bit more about New Testament textual criticism. That is the history of the Greek New Testament manuscripts that have been passed down to us and now are in printed editions. I don't actually have, oh, here we go, I have one. I don't know. I've actually got several up here. I probably said that out away from the microphone. I've got several Greek New Testament editions. All of these little marks at the bottom of the page talk about the history of the Greek New Testament. And I've got an expert in that field with us here, Timothy Mitchell. He just finished a PhD. I'm going to ask him to tell us about that in a minute. But the main reason I brought him on is I want to hear his story as an evangelical Christian who believes in the inerrancy of the Bible and uh, who has studied the, the New Testament's history and, and its manuscripts in great detail. He actually told me the other day when he dropped into my office here in Bellingham, Washington, uh, we're actually standing right now in the offices of Faith Life in Bellingham. They are very graciously allowing me to use this uh, for my personal channel. He told me that he got into textual criticism for reasons of his own searching for truth. And I really want to hear that story. Um, but Tim, start by telling us what degree you just finished. Well, I just finished a PhD in Biblical Studies, focusing on New Testament textual criticism. Um, University of Birmingham is known for their work on uh, the Greek New Testament, among other, uh, you know, the Latin texts as well. And uh, working in uh, with the German institution that produces the NA28, and they have a major, uh, the Editio Critica Major, which is their large critical edition. Um, they've been working closely with that, and I actually utilized uh, the, their recently published edition of Mark a lot, especially their CBGM online tools in my PhD. So that was CBGM is Coherence Based Genealogical Method. That's right. Uh, you can uh, Peter Gurry is somebody who writes a lot about that. I'm really indebted to him and uh, Tommy Wasserman's work on that. Um, yeah, so. Um, that uh, I was working on a group of medieval Greek manuscripts of Mark, uh, known as Family Pie. Okay, so we'll get a little more into that at the end of the interview. I think I'd like to hear just a little bit more sure. detail. But um, you are married with children, wife, and how many kids? I have four children, uh, three biological and, and one a little boy we just adopted a couple months ago. Great. And for 18 years, you have been a... I am an aircraft mechanic, okay, a helicopter mechanic, and I've been working on the side, uh, going to school for a number of years. Wow. And you told me about that path, and that is real diligence, not only on your part, but on the part of your wife. Yes. I might even more so. My family has been very supportive along the way. I could not have gotten where I am academically without the support of my wife and kids. Yeah. Like, and isn't Tim Burr? actually some kind of mechanic as well on aircraft yes i believe he works fuel tanks fuel systems i think if i can recall correctly but yes he's one of the other few that i know <laughs> in this field that works also people who are deeply interested in new testament textual criticism and are some kind of aircraft maintenance yeah you know it's pretty rare I think. <laughs> yeah you probably are the only two in the world well it's so, it's a real honor to have someone like this on my channel we're gonna have Tim Burr. Finally, on my channel, he and I are going to talk soon. Good. Okay, so um, also I wanted to hear, before we get into your story, want everybody to know, where are you headed in ministry now? What's your plan? So uh, right now, uh, we, my wife and I just got onboarded with uh, SEND as missionaries, and our plan is to move to Kiev, Ukraine, and I will be teaching at uh, Kiev Theological Seminary. So we'll be moving our family next year, uh, Lord willing, sometime. Lord willing. Yeah, late summer. So you're raising missionary support at this time. That's correct. Raising support and prayer prayer warriors and financial support and just getting the word out. And if people after this interview are persuaded, we want to support you, what's the best way to do that? You can go on to our SEND, uh, our send uh, page. And you can give through that if you want. Just search for send Timothy Mitchell, maybe something like that. Yeah, something like that. I can't remember what the exact... I'll try to provide the link in okay. the show notes for people. All right, okay. I will try to do that. It's hard to remember all the promises I make in this video. And sometimes people <laughs> ask okay. for the links I promise. Okay, so let's talk about your story. 
um, from what little I've heard, actually, this is the first time I'm going to hear most of this. Okay. It's somewhat similar to Elijah Hickson, our other mutual friend, who was introduced to um, New Testament textual criticism through uh, in, in his teenage years. Mm. In his case, he actually had a pretty strongly King James only youth pastor at his church, which wasn't King James only. And that set him on this path. You told me that it was doubts. Yeah, it was questions about your Christian faith. I presume about the Bible and its inspiration and history that brought you into this field. So start us into that story. Well, I went to a Bible college in Waukesha and uh, we had a great uh, education there. Um, and I moved away and came to work as an aircraft mechanic in the meantime and I got a hold of Bart Ehrman's Misquoting Jesus and also this was uh, in the day when uh, the Da Vinci Code was very much in the water you know and and uh, uh, but the thing that struck me that really uh, cut straight to the heart of the matter was when uh, Ehrman was talking about how we don't have uh, the autographs anymore the and, modern drafts being yeah the the documents that the authors of the new testament wrote yeah that that paul actually yeah. dipped his pen in ink and yeah. scratched out those words we don't have those pieces of papyri yes and but not and there's a an interval between that time and our earliest evidence uh physical evidence manuscripts that we have uh copies of our greek new testament not how much of an interval would you say um it depends on how you date these manuscripts but anywhere from uh, 100 to 200 years or so, right. um, somewhere in there. So probably closer to 200 years. Okay, so he's presenting these facts to you, and yeah. I'm presuming that, like another Christian I just spoke to today who went all the way through Christian college and had no idea that New Testament textual criticism existed, you probably hadn't been introduced to these topics beforehand, or had you? I had some knowledge of it uh, from my dad. I grew up as a pastor's kid, and my dad uh, talked about it uh, some and I remember uh, as a a young child seeing uh, a a Greek New Testament on my dad's desk and and seeing those strange characters that I didn't know much about um, and so I kind of had a little bit of idea and I remember seeing pictures of manuscripts and stuff like that so I I knew that there was something out there but it had never been presented to me in this way and I kind of took it for granted but that that idea that there was a time interval between our earliest evidence and when the New Testament was written, um, how could I know that things weren't changed and altered? And that was basically a Bart Ehrman's argument was, how can we believe in an inspired autograph when we have error-ridden copies? I think right. it was he, his words were something like that. Yeah. So that really, um, you know, gave me a lot of doubt and pause and, and also some related issue with um the canon you know how do we know we ha uh, which books uh are inspired and so that i spent a lot of time reading and studying on my own my dad actually really helped me with this uh, he sent me some articles and um pointed me to some books and i figured you know i'm spending all this time studying i i should probably just go back to school so I spent the next many years uh, earning a bachelor's degree, then an MDiv, and then uh, moving on into a PhD. And in the meantime, um, I I actually published a article in the journal, journal for the Study of the New Testament, which is basically my answer to myself of the doubts that I had had. Wow. And I and um, it may not satisfy everybody's uh, you know questions that they had, but it was really uh the the answer the salve to my my doubts and i feel like the more that i've studied this the more confidence i feel like i can have and that maybe some of the issues that i had with uh trusting in the inspiration of the new testament had some to do with my misunderstanding of what inspiration and preservation meant right and i feel like in some cases uh, in some way that that actually is the the case for Ehrman. Sure. That uh, he had a type of fundamentalist view where God, uh, you know, allegedly guaranteed that he would preserve his word perfectly throughout all ages, which, um, 
you know, I've realized that that really isn't what God has promised and that is not what we have. Right. And, and actually I tie those two together and I try to be really careful about this mm-hmm. because I'm going to believe God's word, even if it runs counter to my experience. So if he said, I'm going to preserve these words perfectly and it's going to be available to all ages. And yet I can't make that square with reality. I'm going to trust him. But if he says things that don't quite amount to, yeah. I'm going to preserve my word perfectly for all true Christians in all ages. Mm-hmm. He says things that are a little more subtle, a little more ambiguous, like mm-hmm. not a jot or a tittle will pass from the law until all mm-hmm. is fulfilled. Is he really saying, yeah, I'm going to give you perfect manuscript copies of the Greek New Testament, yeah. the Hebrew Bible? Yeah, but but I say I'm going to expect God's revelation in history to be in accord with the revelation in his word. So if and I'm, I welcome, you know, you're nodding, I presume you agree, but I want yeah. your feedback on this. And I wonder if this is one of your questions. Like I look out and I see, you know, all of these little footnotes at the bottom of the page in this Greek New Testament edition. This one happens to be, you know, actually a um, collecting um, like the SBLGNT. I don't yeah. know if I've seen the Solid Rock Greek New Testament, but. Yes, I it, have seen that. It's an apparatus of uh, critical editions, actually, not of manuscripts mm-hmm. necessarily. But anyway, it reflects differences in the manuscripts and and I don't have any revelation from God telling me which one of the many, many mm-hmm. slightly differing editions of the New Testament are out there is the perfect one that he must not have meant to tell me not a jot or a tittle will pass from the law. In other words, he wasn't saying you're going to have a perfect manuscript copy of the Greek New Testament. Yeah, I, I really think, especially that passage, he's referring to the fulfillment of his word. The efficacy. Yeah, that he what he says will happen will happen, whether uh, there's not a single manuscript left on the planet that uh, contains those words. His word is will happen. What he says will happen will happen. Yeah, and yet it's not as if what you just said means, well, then we don't have yeah. God's word. We do have very good copies. Mm-hmm. So I want to dig into some of some more of the specific doubts. You, you talked in a general way. Yes. What specific questions about God's word were you carrying into your decision to go ahead and study this, you know, academically? Well, the really the issue of errors uh, in the or variations in the text that there were so many and that uh, as Ehrman said, that our earliest copies were so error-ridden, uh, how can I trust that the uh, first documents that the uh, apostles and prophets wrote, that they weren't error-ridden? And how do I know that those uh, errors were changed so much that we don't actually know what the author wrote? Do you, do you have a specific in mind? Is there a particular passage that kind of rose at the top here no it was it's definitely more it was more of a general question than any specific passage you you could uh point to some of the big ones like the ending of mark or the story of the woman in adultery those are the big obvious ones but i think collectively as a whole that really was the issue that bothered me um, because I felt like, how can I be intellectually honest and say that I do believe in a perfect, um, you know, inspired, inerrant word that was given to us, but when we do have error written copies? And I think some of that is that, you know, how much error or how many var- how much variation in our manuscripts is okay? And I think uh, ultimately, my um, expectation of what uh, I should look for in a perfect copy was really part of the problem is that, you know, it doesn't ultimately it doesn't matter, you know, if I pick up a second century copy of John or, or I should say more third century um, or if I pick up a late medieval, you know, Byzantine copy. I mean, ultimately, they're going to say mostly the same thing. I'm not I'm not going to have some strange doctrine about Jesus. I'm going to know uh, who he was. I'm going to know the gospel. I'm going to know uh, that he died on the cross for my sins. And I think that uh, that's really what I'm trusting in ultimately is the the message of the gospel and what Jesus did on the cross for us and not necessarily 
that I have to have the perfect manuscript or the perfect Greek New Testament with no errors in it whatsoever. Um, and that God works with, that God works through uh, these imperfect things to bring us his perfect message. So this very day on Twitter, one of my um, King James only YouTube commenters is actually one of the more courteous ones. Mm. So he does tend to beat the same drums for a while. He was responding to somebody else who was tagging me on something. And he was saying, you can't hold inerrancy, you know, a belief that God's word is true and every bit of it, everything it affirms mm. is true. Everything it denies is false. You can't hold that together with what you just said about mm. error written copies. How would you respond to something like that? That's a good question. It's something um, I'm not saying that I don't think about still, but I'd have to say that it's different to say that God inspired something and it's inerrant and what our, our access to it is. So we may not have a perfect access to his inerrant word, that it's through the lens of imperfection because we're part of the transmission process, just like you could never point to a, a pastor or a teacher and say that they are 100% perfect in everything that they teach, right. that we're all human and fallible. So there's some imperfection. Um, and it's the same thing with the transmission of the text. So we may have to uh, work at getting to that perfect message, but that doesn't mean that the gospel message that was given to us is imperfect. Right. So in the same way that uh, the authors were inspired and perfect in their message, but our access to it, there are some stages in our access to it. Our access is limited to some degree by our humanness, by our human condition, our simple condition. Yeah. As I've explored these matters, um, I think I was hearing about these things from people I knew were conservative and doctrinally sound mm -hmm. who were firm and errantist. So I wasn't shaken in my faith, mm -hmm. but I can understand why people who first encounter these ideas, mainly from someone like Bart Ehrman would, would be shaken. And even someone right now might be listening and saying, well, come on, like if the differences are as big as the whole ending of Mark, Mark 16, 9 to 20, John 7, 53 to 8, 11, the woman caught in adultery, that that does feel destabilizing to me. But you said those are the big ones. What what are the what's the average difference between um, Greek New Testament manuscripts really like? If those are the exceptions, the big ones, what are the small ones usually like? You know, it's something that anybody could actually look up right now with the tools that are available. If you go to at least for Mark and Acts, if you go onto the uh, CBGM for the new uh, ECM, the Editio Critica Major. Mayor that just came out. Um, you can actually, there's a tool on there in the CBGM where you can compare manuscripts and you'll see um, with the variations that they have uh, listed in these uh, online tools, you can see the percentage of agreement. And you could take the most uh, extreme ones, say Codex Sinaiticus and the majority text, the majority text, uh, you can actually compare those two and see all the places that they differ. Um, you can um, look and, you know, most of the manuscripts in these um, included in these editions, you know, you're talking 80%, uh, 80 percent, 80 something percent is pretty normal. Um, you have some that don't agree the most extreme, but also um, these, the number of these variations are, are pretty small. So if you actually look at the, the, the meaning that they convey, they're not huge in the sense of the meaning that they can for before i ask you to give me a specific example i have to stop and tell everyone you can also go to kjbparallelbible.org because i've translated those differences into english word whereas at the cbgm site i'm presuming it's all in greek still it is yeah it's in greek um so you'd have to know the language is true i didn't think about that yeah so that's one small advantage of my website, kjvparallelbible.org. But let's talk about some of those small differences. If I, you know, open up to a random page in the Greek New Testament right here, what am I most likely to be seeing? What kind of difference? I'm actually curious to see what just comes to the forefront of your mind, tip of your tongue. Honestly, I would say probably word order variations, things like Jesus Christ or Christ Jesus. Right. 
you might find uh, simple omissions, something with the equivalent of like removing the or adding the, or you might have a, a similar a synonym for um, words that both mean in or towards, and uh, they could be uncertain in the tradition, like uh, two equally authoritative branches of the textual tradition could could have both of those readings. And so, um, but it's it's the choice between two ends or two uh, or two towards, you know, two different r- words for in, you know, so something like that. Um, you know, uh, another good edition, English edition would be, uh, I think it's the new King James version, right? They, their footnotes pretty much list any of the translatable differences that you'll find between like the majority text. Yeah. And Nestle like, a, a yeah, like a Nestle Alon, something like the Nestle Alon, because most, most of the tra- most of the, um, variations that you'll find would be even difficult to translate in right. English. Like right. you wouldn't even notice. Because even some of the word order, probably the most, most of the major ones would be something like Christ Jesus, yeah. Jesus Christ. Another one would be, and say instead of saying Jesus Christ, uh, another manuscript might say Son of God or God or something like that. Yeah. Um, so synonyms is a big one. Or Lord, you know, it might say Lord instead of Jesus Christ or Jesus Christ, our Lord. Yeah. Uh, so I'm I'm not a professional New Testament textual critic. I have written some in that space just a little bit at the scholarly level, but mostly it's been at the popular level or for pastors that I've written about this topic. And even here on my YouTube channel, that's more my audience. Um, a suggestion for those of you who are professionals in that world. And I've, I've had Peter Gurry respond positively to comments like this. For you, you're all the time in the details, you know, deep into mm-hmm. all, all of these readings and they sort of loom large. Um, and so you talk about the difference between Sinaiticus and the majority text, which I actually have a copy of right back there on the shelf. Um, and actually it's reflected in here as well. The Salad Rocker New Testament is a really great tool for those of you interested in this topic. Um, you talk about them as extreme. I think you use that word. I might have. Um, they're actually not that extreme. But, but, exact, but I'm thinking in a more popular sense when right. people think, um, oh, Codex Sinaiticus and uh, the late medieval Greek text. Right. Those, those are probably the more the straight and in part that you can go yeah not probably not the furthest but they would be farther apart sure than say comparing another greek a late medieval greek new testament with another medieval greek new testament. and and what a what a king james only is would think i think when he or she hears your story he you started on bart ehrman he brought you some doubts you couldn't handle you weren't sure what to do. You went to your dad, got some help, then you decided to get more schooling. They would think, oh no, you actually made the same error that Bart Ehrman did because it's the two options for them. And I see them say this all the time, you know, not literally every one of them, but I hear this from all over the place in that world. They talk about the options being you can have faith in God or you can have faith in scholarship. And how is that the way it worked out for you that you were forced ultimately as you got more and more into the academic world you either had to trust god's word or you had to trust academics you know i'm that's a good question um i would say that i really clung to the truth in james 1 where if you lack wisdom that ask of god and he gives you wisdom but without as long as you do it without doubt and trusting him that he will and so I would say that I never lost my trust in him um, in the midst of these questions that were swirling in my mind because I knew that he would he would somehow assuage my doubts in some way. Either he would bring the answer that I was looking for or he would reassure me that um, you know the, what the, the way the situation was is okay. And I think it was a little of both that correcting my misunderstandings um but also bringing to light uh the rich heritage that we have in the historical record of for the new testament writings i mean it's it's wonderful and uh, being exposed to that um really made me realize that the case is is not that i'm trusting scholars or trusting god it's really i'm trusting god that he is using people 
and that uh, as he has always done. Yeah, as he's always done. It's just in the sense of I don't sit down in a um, in a church listening to a great preacher preach. I'm not necessarily trust, trusting the preacher. I am in a sense, but I'm all, I have the Bible open in front of me and I'm comparing what the, the preacher is preaching with what the truth of the scripture is. And that doesn't mean I'm not trusting God because I'm listening to this preacher, but I'm understanding that the preacher is a tool, is a an instrument that God is using. And it's the same way that w- whether the scribes knew it or not, that's what they were um, in, in the sense of copying the New Testament. They were tools and instruments that God used. And many of them we have, we have no knowledge of that. They're nameless and faceless. We only na- know the names of a few scholars from antiquity or late antiquity. Um, but really that's what it was, is I was trusting God um, that he was using these people to transmit his message. And, um, you know, you can see it from the er- from a very early time in-, in our scriptures. So in Deuteronomy, I think it's in um, chapter 17, there's actually a command that the king make a copy of the yeah. law he gets he gets a um a master copy from the priest from the uh because they were in charge of, of keeping god's law and he was the king was supposed to copy it down in the sense of being taking part of making it into his heart and also um transmitting it that uh, he want that god wanted to use and meant to always use people to transmit his word. Yeah, it's interesting. We don't have any record, I don't think, of any of the kings actually doing this. And you certainly, you have yeah. to assume that quite a lot of those bad kings didn't do it. But yeah. you wonder, did David, did Solomon do that? Well, I mean, especially in the case of David, he authored scripture, right? Psalms. Um, but yes, I. It, that's really interesting um, because I've thought about that too, that we have no um, knowledge, except the only instance that I can think of was Josiah, and when the priest found the law at yeah. the temple, of course he didn't copy it. But um, I, I can't remember the specific story, um, the details of it. But it might be interesting to look at that and see, and maybe reading between the lines that he might have been influential in promoting recopying that, right. distributing copies of the law. Yeah, um, of, with that new that copy that they discovered in the in the temple. Yeah, King James only is of the Requinite variety actually tend to use that story um, to show that God's word can be lost and recovered. And therefore, it's possible to say for them that the King James Version itself is the recovery actually at what's what's been lost. Hmm. I presume you don't agree with that. But now, so let's uh, let's move on for let's let me make a little comment and see how you react to it. Um, for me. Textual criticism was never a shaking of my faith. You know, the fact that there were differences, because this was presented to me that there were differences between Greek New Testament editions by people who clearly had faith in Christ and in his word, um, I felt I was safe. And I just haven't had that existential doubt. However, what has caused me to struggle is asking, Lord, why would you do it this way? Because empirically speaking, it has caused a lot of confusion or at least been the occasion of a lot of confusion. I don't want to pin this on God. Mm-hmm. You know, there are empirically speaking, I can look out on the internet today on Twitter and see people who are troubled Christian people. I believe they're my brothers and sisters in Christ. Right. Almost always brothers. I'm usually dealing with men. Yeah. I need 9.9% of the time. Um, they're troubled by this. Why do you think God would, I mean, I'm, this is maybe an ineffable question. But why do you think God would allow a little variation to exist in the Hebrew Bible manuscript tradition and in the Greek New Testament manuscript tradition. Have you given thought to that? Yes, I have. I think it it goes down to the very fact that God has made us take part in in bringing his message uh, to the world. I mean, he could have at any point um, or throughout history with the case of the church placed some divinely inspired prophet in every age like uh, some type of oracle that you could go to with your questions and you know that when the person is speaking that it's the voice of god he could have done that yeah 
but he didn't do that. He's he's using uh, everyday people who are trusting and relying on him. And if we step away from the copying of the text and look at just the way that God has um, raised up normal people to preach his word or to bring the gospel through evangelism, it's imperfect, sin- sinful people. And we don't always get it right when we're teaching. You know, we make some mistakes, we learn, we uh, hone and and uh, sharpen our message, uh, improve our techniques so we can reach a broader audience or a specific audience, depending on the context. Um, and it's the same way when we're uh, throughout history, the way God has used regular human beings, yep. sinful, fallible people to copy the text. Um, it's just... Uh, human process, which means that it's prone to error. But I mean, at the same time, just with the preaching of the gospel, because it's public, um, because it's accessible to people in their own language and the scriptures, anybody can pick up a Bible and read, it, it it's, provides a check yeah. on the message. So yeah. when somebody's preaching something in error, the body of Christ can come around that and say, um, you know, I'm sorry, brother, but you're a little off there or uh, take part in helping sharpen that. And it's the same way with the text. The text of the New Testament is transmitted, um, especially nowadays with the internet. Right. Anybody can look up a huge number of the manuscripts online. And if you have knowledge of the Greek or even the Hebrew, um, you can look for yourself. You can yeah. open up your Greek Bible and you can compare manuscripts. Um, you can even forgo the critical edition. So nothing's done in secret. It's there's right. not uh, a smoke filled back room, right? Or a bunch of you know, or computers, yeah, or CBGM, yeah, right, yeah. And and even with the CBGM, um, it's just a way of using a computer to uh, aggregate all these points of editorial decisions on uh, variations of which variation came first. It's not necessarily a computer. You know, some AI robot telling who's actually doing the textual cruise. Yeah, it's it's really just a whole team of people doing the textual criticism, and the CBGM is a program that just brings that all together. It's it's just another tool in your toolbox. They're yeah. the editor, or the I mean, like I said, with the uh, the CBGM, it's online. Mark and Axe is online. You can go on there yourself and yeah. just see everything. Yeah, that's a point I've made frequently. I I think that in the King James only world, because they're not involved in the academic world by and large, and of course God doesn't call most Christians to be involved in that. Yeah, world. they do think of it as a smoke filled back room, and Westcott and Hort, you know, are in are in that room rubbing their hands together with <laughs> delight and trying to mess up everything. And and what I've said is, just go look at the NTVMR website, mm-hmm. the New Testament Virtual Manuscript Room. Yes, yes, and. It sure seems to me like New Testament textual critics anyway, Old Testament I'm not as familiar with, but they like have this mania about putting all the data out for it. Yeah. It just sure doesn't seem to me like they're hiding anything. No, and it's it, it can be overwhelming because there is so much. Right. Um, but that but that's actually one of the, that follows up from what you just said. I want to make this point. Yeah. That um, one of the checks and balances, two of them are time and distance. Yeah, so it's very, it would have been impossible in a time before air travel for even a very powerful Pope, if he even wanted to, to collect all of the Greek New Testament manuscripts in the known world, going all the way into Egypt and Syria and, and of course, Europe or whatever, collect them all, destroy them and replace them with something different. No, it, because they're widely geographically spread and widely spread over time, and yet they have an amazing degree of coherence. That that major testimony to the validity of these copies. Yes, and that's really ultimately the the answer that I ended up publishing. That the thesis of of this article that I published in JSNT was basically because of the way that books were copied in community and networks. It um, it wasn't you know somebody going to Barnes and Noble in uh in egypt and buying a a book that was mass produced it was um you know networks friends communities copying and borrowing books and making their own copies of those borrowed books and so that that inadvertently created an environment where if there were some major changes made 
someone in that network would right. would know that. Right. Um, they would have no control over it, but it would be known um, so that somebody could not uh, foist this text that they ch made huge changes to on an unsuspecting public because it would be all out in the open and known. Okay, I want to bounce a thought off of you then that I've had numerous times. I'm not sure if I've made it public, um, but I've often thought, okay, King James onlyists have a narrative that I have to admit to some degree works. Like, uh, sure, it persuades a lot of people anyway when it comes to um, the the big portions of scripture in the New Testament that are you know disputed. That is really just Mark sixteen nine to twenty, no longer ending in Mark so called, and the woman caught in adultery, John seven fifty three eight eleven. I've already mentioned it. Um, and their narrative accounts for those. Their narrative also accounts for a couple places like Colossians 1, 14, where the blood is taken out, omitted. You know, I don't think that's true, but I understand, I can get the narratives. But where the narrative really stops working for me is with when you actually look, and this is what's really helped my own faith, when, when you actually look at page after page after page of the differences, and you can do this on kjbparallelbible.org, what you get is Jesus Christ versus Christ Jesus and when his mother Mary versus when as his mother Mary. Mm -hmm. And uh, David called the king once versus twice in um, the genealogy of Jesus. I mean, there's just utterly no difference in meaning. Yeah. And it seems to me they've got no patience for or interest in explaining how did how did all of these, you know, um, these differences develop, the ones that don't mean anything. Um, does that sound right to you yes um that is something like this whole question with um you know the bigger the conspiracy the the more impossible it is there's actually examples in uh antiquity where the roman em empire or just the emperor himself tried to um ban certain books or certain poems Hesiod is, is one example that um, where he was banished, I believe that's the, the name of the person, was banished and into exile and their works were um, banned, but we still have copies of them and they're even, um, people still read them even in antiquity. I think of the, just before uh, the time of Constantine, you had one of the largest um, conspiracy, uh, uh, not uh, not conspiracies. <laughs> Sorry, the conspiracy was on mine. Um, persecution. You have one of the largest persecutions um, of of antiquity. It was the Diocletian persecution? Yes, and uh, people. You know, Eusebius writes about this. People were giving up their scriptures. Um, but yet, we still have copies of the Bible even before then. We have copies of the Bible afterwards. It didn't. It really didn't. It might have put a dent on it. We don't really know, but um, God's word still preserved. They could, even in the might of the empire, focused in on trying to eradicate, um, you know, the the, 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 faith. the yeah the yeah. Christian faith. They couldn't do it, and the reason why is because it was so dispersed, um, and you know it was uh, so um, broad, and there was no centralized point where you cut the head of the snake and the snake dies right you know it there was no head of the snake the head of the snake you know was god you know right it's, yeah it's you put that one you know. yeah so i don't know if that even addressed the question that yeah I no i think i think that's helpful i mean the reason one of the big reasons that the, the new testament textual criticism and old testament are so different is that there was no, you know, there's no Jerusalem temple, as it were. Yes, and and someone will might say, well, what about Rome? But that developed, you know, many centuries. Yes, yeah, that's many later. years later. And even then, um, you have even in well into the time after Constantine, uh, you have different factions and groups uh, within the Christian circles. It it wasn't necessarily monolithic. It was monolithic in their belief in the in the central central doctrines of Christianity, but there was some differences here and as there, there are today, yeah, as there are today. Uh, there, um, so, you know, even big movements in antiquity trying to centralize authority, see in Rome or in a certain type of doctrine, um, a lot of those elements failed if it wasn't for 
the different community of believers uh, agreeing with it. Um, so to have some type of centralized authority ramming down a certain text or a certain type of theology, there really was no uh, uh, mechanics for that. It, it, was, it was impossible, really, in antiquity. And you, honestly, even today. I mean, I, I, go ahead. No, I, that, that was my... So I, I find this helpful, and you remind me of Tim Berg, because I'm constantly thankful for his interest in history. Uh, it's in part, large part, actually, because of witnessing Tim's gifts. I just think very highly of him that I started calling myself a philologist. It's kind of an excuse to not have to do as much reading in history. But here we go, folks. This is the kind of thing that a textual critic has to get into. And actually, one of the reasons that I've sort of quailed looking at that field, I feel like because the the major modern evangelical way of looking at textual criticism, which you embody and so do I, which I accept and so do you, because it says, let's take account of all the evidence that we can, mm. suddenly you're committed to looking at tons and tons and tons of facts inductively. And it's just mind boggling to watch the guys who are in this field. There are women too. Yeah. Amy Sue Anderson is one I have encountered on Facebook, had some back and forth with. It's been fun. Um, but they, they just have to know so many things. You have to be able to bring so many analytical tools and historical tools uh, to this work. And you were just doing that for us. And I find that valuable. So thank you for that. You're welcome. Um, another thing about textual criticism is there is concern with, uh, you know, narrowing down what the authors wrote and the earliest attainable form of the text. But a part of a big part of the discipline is also uh, reconstructing the history of how it was transmitted in the various branches and and um, what type of Greek text uh, the different translations were copied from, and um, or where did some of the versions um, later influence the uh, Greek text? You know, you have some instances of that as well. So it's just a big picture of the history of from the time that the author first released the writing. Um, and it was copied in the various streams to how we have it today. I mean, that's really the textual criticism encompasses all those things. So in my case, with my um, dissertation, I, that I was more, I'm more in the field uh, or in the realm of discovering a small or narrowing down a, a small portion of the transmission history and, and not necessarily in, um, hammering out what the earliest form of the text was. But all those things are necessary because in the sense of determining what the what the words were that the apostles wrote or the, the prophets wrote, because when you hammer out the history of the text, then you know, uh, you can't know what the earliest form was if you don't know what the later form was. Yeah, so let me ask you about this. Yeah, um, It isn't my world. I try to be responsible when I talk about this world. But I have been hearing more often recently, oh, those textual critics, they've stopped even trying to recover the original text. Is that true? How would you respond to that? Well, some of that is a definitional issue. Um, what does the original text mean? Or what is an autograph? All that kind of stuff. But that's definitely not true. Um, the, the, this big critical edition, the ECM that was just produced, that's one of the goals was to um, hammer out what is the initial text, which basically is the earliest attainable form of the text, as close as possible to what uh, the authors wrote. So that's very much a goal. But also the value of the, the ECM is that you have all of this manuscript evidence that you can use in reconstructing the history of how this text was um, copied over the years, which I utilize the ECM data very much in, in my dissertation. So yes, it's, it's definitely a goal that's still there, but in conjunction with, um, not at, to the exclusion of, also discovering the history. Transmission history. Yeah, transmission history. Th this is one of those arguments that I hear often enough with enough specificity and from intelligent King James only is frankly that I think it is coming from somewhere. And I want to say it's something that David C. Parker wrote. Is that familiar to you? Are there non-believing New Testament textual critics who have given up 
to search for even the initial text. Where are they getting this, the King James only? Um, yes, you could say that there are some who um, would say that we don't know what the earliest text, we can never recover it because the text is so fluid. Uh, David Parker even has a book called The Living Text um, that kind of argues a little bit that uh, uh, from that angle. Uh, obviously, Ehrman has made comments like that and is more popular books. But then when you actually focus in and narrow in on what this fluidity is, um, it's really like, um, this is the term that Michael Holmes used. It's a micro level fluidity yeah. in the sense of word order, maybe even uh, sent, uh, you might have a, a verse placed here instead of here or um, some addition or some omission. So at the micro level, there's some fluidity, but the macro level, yeah, it's very, very stable. I mean, we can take a tiny credit card fragment of John from the second century, right? And we can tell exactly where it is in John. And it's only a few words on either yeah. side because the text ha is overall on a macro level, very stable. Through right. all over the century. That's the point I've made repeatedly on this channel as I've been dragged somewhat kicking and screaming into talking about New Testament textual criticism because, no offense, because I love the field, but I feel that it's more important in a King James only debate to talk about translation and readability than it is text. As I've gotten uh, into this and talked about this on the channel, one thing I found myself just assuring people and trying to insist upon as well is that, yes, there is micro level difference between texts and actually between translations. So they might be looking at the same Greek text, but they might go different directions that both are allowed by that Greek text and the way to translate it. But there's macro level continuity and stability. Mm -hmm. I do often think of that joke of somebody who is in the flood and you know they're waiting to be rescued and they pray to the Lord to rescue them and along comes a boat and they refuse it and then the water levels rise and they're on the roof and along comes a helicopter and they refuse it because no, no, the Lord's going to save me. And then they die. And God <laughs> says, you know, I speak as a fool. I don't like using God's name for jokes, but uh, he says, well, I sent those to help you. Like, why did you not accept that help? I, I feel like that with textual criticism and because I understand the impulse of Bible believers, which you and I are mm -hmm. to have a perfect text. You, it does feel like God ought to have done it that way. He ought to tell us which one's exactly right and perfect if we're an errantist. But he didn't. Instead, his method was to give us tons of very good copies by which, you know, checking all over the known world and all over time, we can do the minor amount of reconstruction that we need to do. It's like him sending the boat in the helicopter and we're refusing it. Mm -hmm. If we say, no, no, we're only going to accept it if it's if it's perfect. So let's let's wrap this up by talking again about your personal story. What it, it's been 18, well, no, that's not right. However many years it's been that you've been after <laughs> undergrad. Okay, about 18 years. Then. Yeah, from the undergrad to when I got my PhD, so, something about that. Yeah, a lot of time spent. Yeah. A lot of sacrifices made. Did you achieve your original objective? Yes, I believe so, and more, more so, because um, not only in this area of the, the original question was, the time span between when the authors wrote to our earliest evidence, how do I know things didn't get changed so bad that we don't know what they wrote? Not only that, but um, just all these different aspects of copying and things like um, how the the copies would not, they would make mistakes while they're, why they're uh, making their copy, but they would actually go back and correct it too. And there are multiple so, hands of correctors. Yes. And there's people using it over the, the years and also correcting it. Um, so, you know, I would say that God has answered my question plus even more so. So, um, and, and, you know, to go back really quick to uh, what you were saying about that analogy of the helicopter and the boat, you know, um, the other thing with these manuscripts that uh, God's used this way that maybe you can come in a critical way and um, uh, with doubt or, or uh, in a negative viewpoint, it's also, if you want to put a positive spin on it, it's a really fascinating, beautiful field. I mean, these uh, some of these manuscripts, many of them are just wonderful works of art yeah. that are made in worship to God. 
right? Um, that they're made as an act of worship. Uh, many of them were very expensive. Um, that would take, uh, you know, thousands and thousands of dollars in today's money to, to produce hours and hours of labor. And they're made as a labor of love and worship to God. So that's, it's really fascinating and wonderful to just see that residue of these, these, um, of the physical act of worship laid out in this manuscript. So it can be a very joyous and fascinating yeah. field as well. Well, and for someone who hears about typography, those unsure manuscripts like Sinaiticus, I I just marvel because I took calligraphy in college yeah. and I still do it for fun on occasion, but I only send it to family because I, it's just not very good, let's be frank. But you yeah. look at those perfectly formed letters and how evenly spaced they are. It is... It's, it is really, really remarkable. Well, Tim, thank you so much for coming on the channel and serving my viewers. The goal here is to increase your faith and scripture and to demonstrate that the copies of scripture that we have are reliable. And yet we're both in the somewhat awkward position, uh, but we accept it from God of being an errantist who believe that whatever God says is so. The Bible is inspired, both the Old and the New Testaments and the Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek that God originally gave it in. And yet God has not chosen to give us absolutely perfect copies or to tell us how to find them. Instead, as with the preaching of the gospel, which he could have done himself, he's put it in the hands of people like you, Tim. And thank you for, along with Peter Gurry and Elijah Hickson and other friends of mine, actively taking part in this kind of work. Thank you so much. Thank you very much.